want to thank my uh, good friend and colleague, Rick Wooling, for uh, being here last Sunday as uh, Holly and the kids and I had an opportunity to be away uh, for a time of vacation. Uh, we enjoy uh, the opportunity to go to Lakeside, Ohio, uh, pretty much every year for the last 10 years and to spend some time on the lake. Uh, but uh, we did have the opportunity to uh, tune in to the worship service, and I really appreciated Rick's message, and I also enjoyed uh, hearing all the cicadas and also the chickens that were clucking uh, last Sunday. Uh, all of that could be heard on the live stream, uh, which I was uh, delighted to, uh, to see and to hear and to uh, see that worship was uh, continuing in good stead uh, in my absence. We continue in our series this morning, getting into rhythm as we look at the feasts that are found in Leviticus chapter 23. And our text for this morning is verses 15 through 22 as we consider the Feast of Weeks. And I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. The day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, you shall count 50 days the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling place two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven, a first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and their drink offering food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, Come before you this morning. We ask, Lord, that we indeed might feast and celebrate on the good food that you are providing for us this day. Your word, which is the bread of life. Pray, Lord, that we might receive it with gladness. That we might eat with you and be fed. That your name might be great among your people, and among this community, here in Mount Lebanon. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I often get asked to pray at meals. It's kind of a occupational hazard, something that comes with the job. I'm often asked to pray at, uh, at uh, rehearsal dinners. I'm asked to pray at receptions following weddings. I've been invited to many of your homes, and you've been very gracious and kind and so to do, and uh, when I come, you often afford me the, the honor and the privilege of saying grace uh, before the meal. Pastor, would you mind praying for our dinner? And I'm always delighted and happy to do so. I pray uh, quite a bit uh, for meals at occasions that I find myself in where there's the opportunity so to do. As I said, it's a bit of an occupational hazard. It doesn't come without its risks from time to time. I remember uh, an occasion in which my good friend and colleague Rick Wooling had an opportunity to pray at uh, dinner, and one of his grandkids were there, 
and uh, Rick was asked to pray, and I don't remember which grandkid it was, it may have been Cooper, and when Rick was asked to pray, there was this audible, <laughs> to which he then responded, is this going to be one of those long pastor prayers? <laughs> Pastors never pass an opportunity to preach, even in their prayers, and it's a bit of a occupational hazard, but you might be surprised to find or to hear what is the traditional prayer that I offer at meals in our home. As much as you may have heard me pray in leading worship or leading prayer at a meal over lunch or in your home for a dinner, when I sit down to eat with my family, my prayer for dinner is almost always the same. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be thinking to yourself, are you kidding me? That's so cheap, mate. Why aren't you using some of the more expensive theological words. Why don't you throw in propitiation? <laughs> penal substitutionary atonement. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you're thinking, well, it's an act of mercy to his family. They hear him blather on all the time. And so at dinner, he gives them a reprieve and simply says, thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Or maybe you're thinking, and there's probably a kernel of truth in this, he just wants to eat. Let's get to it. Let's get this prayer moving along as quickly as we can, and let's get to the food. And there may be, as I said, a kernel in truth of truth in that. Or, or perhaps you're thinking, well, he's, he's preserving, he's conserving precious resources. He's got to pray and he's got to look good praying whenever he's got to stand up at your house or in front of the church. So don't use up all the good words at home. Save that for when you're in front of an audience. Now, there may be some truth to all of these reasons. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't reflected deeply upon it. But I want to share with you that the reason I pray, thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's because it was my dad's traditional prayer at mealtime. I remember growing up, we would always, uh, with regularity, have an opportunity to eat together as a family. And the family would be working to put the dinner on the table. And my dad would sit at the head of the table, and he would sit down, and he would pray, almost always, without variation, and he was a man of God, a, a man of faith, someone who loved Jesus, who was saved powerfully uh, in, his, uh, in his early 20s and came to know the Lord and loved the Lord, uh, grew up in the, uh, in the uh, Roman Catholic tradition, but uh, hadn't heard the gospel. And when he heard the gospel, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he would sit down at dinner, he would say, thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. And I remember that prayer. I remember seeing him sitting down and praying that prayer night after night, week after week, year after year. I can remember my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, who was not much of a person of faith himself, and on a few occasions he would be asked to pray, usually at Thanksgiving or a holiday. We'd be at his house or he'd be at our house, and he would always pray the same thing. Bless us, O Lord. These thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. All I have to hear is, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. And I have an image, a vivid memory of my grandfather, Robert Zunkel, standing, presiding at the table. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty. Christ our Lord, amen. I have a vivid memory of my father praying at the table. 
Thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. It appears as though I come from a tradition of prayer. I remember my grandfather praying. I remember my father praying. And that has informed my own approach to prayer. So since my eldest, Hannah, was born, and she was old enough for me to put her to bed and to say prayers with her at night, I prayed the same prayer with her and subsequently with her brother Nathan and with their sister Abigail. I pray the same prayer almost every night and continue with Abigail on the occasions in which I still put her to bed. And for years I prayed this, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I pray, Lord, that you be with Hannah. I pray, Lord, that you be with Nathan. I pray, Lord, that you be with Abigail. Help them to have a good night's sleep. No bad dreams. Keep them safe and healthy. Help them to grow in their friendship with you and with their family. Amen. I pray that prayer almost every night as I put the kids to bed. This tradition of prayer has created in our family a culture of prayer through prayer. And I'm seeking to communicate something to my kids. I'm seeking to pass something on to my children, something precious, by giving them an inheritance in the form of a holy culture to pass on to them the prayer of my fathers. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm seeking to give them a richness of an inheritance in the form of a holy culture. Now, holy culture is defined in a particular way. And I want to help to define that for you this morning. And since we don't have the use of the screen and I don't have the bullet points, I went ahead with alliteration, hopefully to help you to remember. A holy culture is comprised of five things. It is comprised of cultivation, sanctification, communication, celebration, and invitation. I'll say it again for those who are taking notes. Cultivation, sanctification, communication, celebration, and invitation. I'm seeking to, to give my family, to give my kids a holy culture by cultivating precious resources that have been entrusted to me given to me, passed down to me by my fathers. Treasure of time, a resource of time and treasure and, and talent, my dad's prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. To cultivate that into the hearts and minds of my kids. Time and time and time again. A holy culture is comprised of cultivation and sanctification. Cultures are by definition distinct and set apart. African culture is very different than European culture, and European culture is very different than North American culture, and North American culture is very distinct from South American culture, and South American culture is distinct from Asian culture. Cultures are by definition distinct, but a holy culture is made distinct by God. A holy culture is set apart by God, by His Word, and by His presence. And so we sit down for a meal and we ask the Lord to sanctify and to set apart this meal with gratitude. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. A holy culture is comprised of not only cultivation and sanctification, but communication. Communion is required in order for a culture to exist, in order for a culture to thrive, in order for a culture to grow. It bonds people together, people holding precious things together in common. And I receive the precious thing from my fathers. Thank you, Lord, for this food. A culture of 
gratitude and appreciation whereby we confess and recognize that what we have is given to us as a gift by God. And passing on that attitude to my children. It requires communion and communication. Things must be shared. Things must be held in common. Held in common not only with one another, but with God as well. A holy culture is comprised of cultiva cultivation and sanctification and communication, but also celebration. A culture must remember. Precious things must be remembered and kept alive. A living culture is a holy culture that honors the past, remembers what has been entrusted, and keeps it alive and anticipates its good life and flourishing into the future. And so there'll be times when which I sit down at dinner and in my haste I'm ready to eat. And one of my kids will say, have we prayed? Who's prayed? And it's usually on that occasion when I say, well, why don't you pray? And my ears are delighted when I hear, thank you, God, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. The holy culture must be cultivated, sanctified, enjoying communion, celebration, but also invitation. A holy culture invites others to join with you and to share in the good inheritance that has been given. In our text today, we see God creating a holy culture through Israel as he gives to them something precious. It's called the Feast of of weeks. God is establishing a holy culture in and among his people as he gives to them a feast known as the Feast of Weeks. We also know the Feast of Weeks as the Feast of Pentecost because the Feast of Weeks took place 50 days after the Passover celebration. Remember the Passover celebration takes place and the following day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that takes place for seven days. That begins the marking of time, the setting aside of seven full weeks, 49 days. And one day after is the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. It is the culmination of the wheat harvest. You begin the, the, uh, the barley harvest with the first fruits, the Feast of First Fruits that Pastor Wooling talked about last week. And here at the Fe Feast of Weeks, you bring in the wheat. The barley's been up. Now you bring in the wheat and you celebrate what God has given. God is creating a holy culture by commanding Israel to cultivate. To cultivate the resources that God has given graciously and kindly to them. Cultivating the seeds that were deposited into the land. I love Rick's devotional comment. Because he's precisely right that God had given seeds long before Israel had even entered into the land. It's an idea that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. When God created the earth. God speaks. There's a dialogue within the triune Godhead. And God says to himself, we can't send the rain, we can't send the moisture yet because it will activate the seeds and there's no man upon the earth to cultivate it. So God is at work long before we are. God is at work long before Israel comes into the land. And God has deposited seeds, richness, goodness, into the land. And Israel was called to cultivate it. To cultivate not only the seeds, but the fruit of those seeds that brings about wheat. And wheat's a good thing. Bread is so much better. Not only bread, but leavened bread. A symbol of the kingdom of God that, that celebrates the kingdom and the waving of the leavened bread before God. But not only that, Israel is called to cultivate and to bring in the fruit of the livestock to offer seven lambs, two rams, and a bull as evidence of cultivation, evidence of development. To cultivate the land, to cultivate the community, to cultivate an economy, 
to cultivate not only an economy, but an education whereby you're training your children in the way that they should go, how to husband the land, how to nurture the land, how to bake the bread, how to gather together in celebration of all that God has done to create a holy culture, a spiritual culture, an alive culture, a vital culture, to anticipate it with children each year as this is established as an ordinance by God forever, to be celebrated by God's people. God is creating a holy culture. He commands Israel to cultivate. He commands Israel not only to cultivate, but to be holy. And God himself provides what is necessary in order that the people might be holy. He says, take one male goat for a sin offering. Take two lambs for a peace offering, and I will receive them from you. They shall be a substitute for the sin that resides in your hearts and your minds. But I will receive it graciously and kindly in order that your sins might be atoned for. In order that you might be a holy people. God makes provision for a culture and a people of holiness. This is who they are called to be. God is cultivating or making a holy culture through cultivation, sanctification, and communication. As a holy culture, Israel must commune. They're invited in the Feast of Weeks to literally share a meal with God. Thank you, God, for this food. Bless it, God, as we enjoy it with you. Not only to share a meal with God as they wave, wave the bread, wave the food, Present the sacrifices and the smoke and the fire goes up. as a pleasing aroma to God as they celebrate a meal together, but to celebrate that meal with one another. There is no culture without the sharing of it. And the fastest way to destroy a culture is to separate people from one another. No longer holding precious things in common. God is calling Israel to cultivate holiness, to commune and to share, and to celebrate as a people. A holy culture must celebrate. So Israel is called to celebrate the Feast of Weeks annually within a rhythm of life throughout the year. To honor and to remember the past. To celebrate and to remember God's deliverance out of Egypt. To remember God's continued providence and provision in their lives. To remember his faithfulness to the generations. And to anticipate a good future. God is calling Israel to invite. As a holy culture to invite others in. The gleaning laws that we read at the end of our text is not necessarily a matter of social justice. It's not a program of welfare, even though it provides for a measure of justice, even though it provides for a measure of welfare for the poor, for the sojourner, it is actually an invitation to participate in a way of life. It invites the other, because all of us are poor. All of us are sojourners. All of us are in exile, yet God makes provision. In order that we might come in, he invites us in. The Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost is the means by which God creates a holy culture. My good friend and a colleague at Trinity School for Ministry, Dr. Don Collett, whom you've met before, he has a saying which I appreciate. He says, the Old Testament always gets there first. It's not the Old Testament, it's the First Testament. And the Old Testament gets there first. And so we shouldn't be surprised when Jesus takes all the richness and the power and the goodness and the meaning of the Feast of Weeks, of the Feast of Pentecost, and makes it present in his own Pentecost festival. As he calls the disciples forward, he says, I want you to wait 50 days. I'm going to deposit something into your life. And scandalously, 
Particularly in our own day and age, we read in the Gospel of John where Jesus breathes onto the disciples to communicate something to them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit and wait. Wait for 50 days as the work of cultivation begins to happen in your heart and in your lives. And Jesus sanctifies his people by his blood. He is that sacrificial lamb that is then ministered and mediated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the disciples communicate. They begin to share and to hold things in common as they are given the ability to speak as tongues of fire come down and sanctify the disciples and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They go out to share. To share the good news of the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the disciples celebrate. They remember they remember the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross. They remember his, uh, his resurrection from the dead. They remember his ascension into glory and power. And they share that with all who are listening. On that day, when Christ establishes a holy culture in the church. And others are invited to participate and join the church through repentance, through faith, through baptism. People, they were born that day. Holy culture called the church. The Beverly Heights is a place of festivity. The Beverly Heights Church is a work of holy culture. For 91 years, established in 1929. For 91 years, this has been a place that has been made stable by a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, by his word, and through his gospel. Seeds have been planted and entrusted for us to cultivate. Resources have been given to us sacrificially by the past and by God. Saints who received good things by God and said, thank you, God, for this food, for this provision. We thank you, blessed in Jesus' name, and deposited those resources here in order that they might be cultivated. We remember the past, and we thank the past, and we recognize that we as a church, Beverly Heights Church, has been set apart to be made distinct and to be made holy. I was sharing with the staff this week that the time has come. It's a season for the church. And for our church in particular, whereby we are called to be sanctified and to be set apart. I said in every football game, every football game, I was a tackle. It was my job to separate the defense from the ball in order that we might win. It was the job of the wide receiver to separate from the defensive back in order that he might catch the ball and go into the end zone and win. There's a point in every race where you're running with the herd. But if you want to win, you got to separate. And that's when Jen came up with the best analogy, the, the word that summarized it all. It's called the kick. Where you run with that crowd. But now it's time to cross the, the goal line, to cross the finish line, and to win the race. And you got to kick. you got to have a measure of separation. God is calling us to the kick. To preserve a holy culture and to be who God has called us to be. We're at the kick and God is calling us to communication, to hold precious things in common and to share them with one another. One faith, one hope, one Lord, one God. To share those precious things in common with one another with God and with other people, and to communicate those precious things to each other. To communicate those precious things with the world, with our community, with Mount Lebanon. God is calling us to be a holy culture and to celebrate, to honor the past. I'll never forget the first Sunday, which I had the privilege to serve as your senior pastor. And I stepped out of the pulpit 
and I walked down the steps and I extended my arms and there was this look on everyone's face. What's he going to say? What's this going to sound like? You heard the words, now go out into the world in peace. And your eyes lit up. Your faces began to shine. You heard something. You heard a, a benediction that remembered and honored the past, but was ushering us into a, a good and glorious future. We are a place of celebration, whereby God has called us to celebrate. And we are a place of invitation. The days ahead will be challenging. There's no question about it. The days ahead will be challenging. But the days ahead will be filled with the abundance of God. That's what I can offer you. That's what I'm inviting you into. And that's what I'm asking you to invite others into. It won't be easy, but it will be filled with the abundance of God as we celebrate and enjoy the holy culture, the goodness of God that God has called us to be. So a few things to consider as we close this morning. The first is this. Every culture whether sacred and holy, or secular, whether local or national, every culture must be stewarded. Every culture must be protected. Every culture must be nurtured, or it runs the risk of being lost. God has called us to be. God has called us to be something something savory, something brilliant, something active, something good and glorious, and it must be stewarded, it must be protected, it must be nurtured, or it will be lost. Second takeaway thought is this, we are midweek. So we find ourselves in the middle of the week's between Passover and Pentecost. We are in the last days. And we are moving toward a wonderful celebration. A feast. A feast of the culmination of the weeks. A feast that is called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. You can read about it in the book of Revelation. It is a glorious feast whereby we will come and we will have opportunity to take into our hands the good things that God has given to us to cultivate, and we will be required to wave them and to show them. And so as we find ourselves midweek, or within the weeks, we have the opportunity to ask, how am I doing? What has been my work of cultivation? Am I ready to feast? And finally, culture Cultivation, festivity, they are impossible without proper and strong affection. My dad and I, we have a rocky relationship. It's uneven. And our family life, even though we were raised in the Christian home, both my parents were believers. It was less than idyllic. And I'll spare you any of the gory details. But at the end of the day, I still love my dad. And I love and appreciate what he gave me. I, I love that prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. It's given me a place. It's given me a position by which I am positioned to bless my kids. To serve them. To bestow upon them something that is precious. Because I love them. Take the love that was shown to me and to pass it on to them. 
we say thank you, God, for this new blessing in Jesus' name. So, Lord, our prayer is simply this. Thank you. Thank you for this food. We thank you that it has been blessed by your Spirit. We receive it with gladness. May you be glorified, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please take your bulletin and join with me now in our closing scriptural affirmation taken from Acts chapter 1. I invite you to join with me. So when they had come together, they asked him, 